terrifying going last after interesting talks. I've been filling up an analog side with a mind map that I'm then going to go home and type up, which is very ironic on all sorts of levels. I want to, I approach this through the idea of human machine interactions because I think that often we totally miss out the fact that we have relationships with and through machines, digital tools, systems, and these are in themselves emotional, fraught, human, and yet we insistently pretend that they are rational and features-based and about shiny gadgets, and they're not. And if you've seen anyone without phone reception or dead batteries, you realise that human-machine interactions are not a matter of rationality or emotional self-control. And when I think about the future of human-machine interactions, there's two entwined anxieties that come to mind. I like to chase our anxieties. First, there's the tension between individual and collective existence. Technology connects us to each other as never before, and when it does this, it makes explicit the degree to which we are defined and anticipated by others, the ways in which even our ideas and our identities, they don't belong just to us. They're part of a larger human ebb and flow. Just follow a hashtag. Now, this has always been true, but rarely has it been more evident or more constantly available for experience. Recently in human history, less than 100 years, an eye blink that the majority of the world's adult population has been literate. Most of history, for most people, is a matter of silence and darkness. And now, just in the last 20 years, we've had an even bigger revolution on the heels of this first, that through connected devices, through billions of connected devices that have massive penetrations even across sub-Saharan Africa and the world's poorest regions, for the first time, a majority of the world's population are active participants in written and recorded culture. It's astonishing, it's disconcerting. The crowd in the cloud is becoming a stream of shared consciousness. That's the first thing I think of, this human ebb and flow. And secondly, there's the question of how we see ourselves. Human nature is a baggy, capacious concept. It's one that technology has altered and extended throughout history. But I think digital technologies pose an increasingly anxious kind of challenge in asking us what kind of place we occupy in the universe, what it means to be self-aware, rational creatures. Our machines aren't yet minds, but they are taking on more and more of the ground that we used to carefully stake out as uniquely human, reason, action, reaction, language, logic, adaptation, learning, the creation of things we find beautiful. And so we are beginning to ask what transforming consequences this extension and usurpation will bring. Now I call these anxieties in entwined, even though I can't quite say it, because they come accompanied by a shared error. And this error for me is the overestimation of both our rationality and our autonomy. In asking what it means to be human, we are prone to think of ourselves as individual rational minds. And we tend to describe our relationships with and through technology on this basis. We are isolated users whose agency and freedom are a matter of skills and reasoned options and drop-down menus. We are task performers who are existentially threatened by any more efficient agent. This is one view of human-machine interactions, but it's an account of human beings that gives us at once too much and too little credit. We know ourselves to be intensely social, emotional, intractably embodied creatures. Much of the best recent work across economics, psychology, neuroscience and other fields has emphasised the degree to which we cannot be unbundled into distinct capabilities, into machine-like boxes of memory, processing and output. Neither language, culture nor a human mind can exist in isolation. 
or spring into existence fully formed. We are interdependent to a degree we rarely admit. We have very little in common with our creations and a nasty habit of blaming them for stuff we're doing to ourselves. Now what makes this urgent is the brutally Darwinian nature of technological evolution. Our machines may not be alive, but the evolutionary pressures surrounding them are every bit as intense as in nature and with few of its constraints. Vast quantities of money are at stake, with corporations and governments vying to build faster, more efficient and more effective systems to keep consumer upgrade cycles ticking over. To be left behind is to be unacceptably outcompeted. As the philosopher Daniel Dennett, among others, has pointed out, this logic of upgrade and adoption extends far beyond obvious fields such as finance, warfare, and manufacture. The algorithm is proven to produce more consistently accurate diagnoses than a physician. It's both unethical and legally questionable to refuse to use it. As self-driving or semi-autonomous cars become more affordable and road legal, it's hard to argue against the ethical and regulatory case for making them compulsory, and so on and so on. Few fields of human endeavour are likely to remain untouched. In other words, machines are becoming stunningly adept at taking decisions for us on the basis of vast amounts of data, and they are getting better at this at an equally stunning rate. If we forget for a moment the hypothetical emergence of general purpose artificial intelligence, we are handing over more and more of what happens in our world today to the speed and efficiency of unthinking deciders. And it's precisely because our present machines can neither think nor feel that this matters. We call them smart. We marvel at their powers. We giggle at Google. We paint pictures of a world in which they, not we, are determining what we do and how. This is what people do. We see purpose, autonomy and intent everywhere. We remorselessly ascribe agency to the world in order to understand it. But in doing this, in ascribing an agency that our tools do not possess, we misunderstand several fundamental points. Humans are not slow and dumb and heading for the evolutionary scrap heap. Machine efficiency is a very poor model for understanding ourselves. And cutting people out of every possible loop, the better to assure speed and profit and military success. This is an equally poor model for a future in which humans and machines equally maximise their differing capabilities. Our creations are effective partly because they are unburdened by most of what makes humans human. The broiling biological pot of emotion, sensation, bias and belief that is the bulk of our mental lives. We are biased, beautiful creatures, sometimes at least. Technology and intellect allow us to externalise our goals, but the ends pursued are those we have chosen. And so we must ask, do the incentives our tools tirelessly pursue on our behalf include human thriving, meaningful work, rich and humane interactions? Do we believe these things to be unachievable, unknowable or worthless? And if we don't, at what point exactly are we going to shift our focus? So if we want to build better machines, but also better relationships with and through machines, I believe we need to start talking far more richly about the qualities of these relationships, about how precisely our thoughts and feelings and biases operate, and what it means to aim beyond efficiency at lives worth living. What does a successful collaboration between humans and machines look like? I think, among other things, it looks like one where humans remain in the loop, able transparently to assess a system's incentives and either to influence its direction or debate its alteration. 
And what does a successful collaboration between humans mediated by technology look like? Well, we've been hearing the story of precisely that. I think we know what this means when we ask ourselves. It's characterized by the maximization of all resources involved. Human creativity, particularity, and questioning. Machine, search, speed, processing, and recall. An iteration involving all parties. And I think, above all, the recognition that efficiency is not an end in itself, but simply a measure of velocity. And so, finally, I think we should be clear that this is a very exciting time to be alive, not that we have much choice. And if there's one thing that our swelling collective articulacy as a species brings home, it's that people care above all about other people, for better and for worse. What we think, do, believe, fear, hate, love, laugh at, what we can make together. I think one of the few certainties we can cling on to when we try to look ahead is that our creations are going to grow far beyond our current comprehension. And for many people, how far and how fast is one of our most urgent existential questions. But I think that our best hopes of progress remain deceptively familiar, trying to understand ourselves better, asking what aims may serve not only our survival, but also our thriving, and then striving to build systems that pursue rather than subvert these aims. Thank you.